Our final talk of the first day of our conference is by Joseph Wilson from the Department of Anthropology in our university, University of Toronto. Joseph, it's all yours. Take it from here. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'm uh, happy to join the, the conversation today. Uh, I've been dipping in and out all day. It's uh, it's conference season, right? So it's a little hectic. Um, so yeah, I work in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto, uh, working on my doctorate at the moment in uh, linguistic anthropology, one of the kind of four fields of North American anthropology. Uh, and usually I work with scientists, computer scientists working in um, artificial intelligence and specifically large language models. Um, so I'm gonna talk about something a little different. This is some work I did based on some work I did on my master's a few years ago, um, which was looking at the metaphor of artificial intelligence, the idea of kind of analogizing computer comp computation and computing behavior to that of the human mind, um, kind of mid-century um, a mid-century comparison that, that that came forth, and how that proliferated in the literature of the time. So, um, you know, there's plenty of examples of uh, metaphors that are proposed that become foundational. They become theory constitutive of a field. Um, you know, there's a number of examples of this, um, you know, from the kind of uh, plum pudding or billiard ball model of the atom, uh, the solar system model, uh, imagining electrons as a cloud around uh, an atom. We really need metaphors for the things on the screen here are, of course, uh, invisible and incorporeal. Um, and we need metaphors to ground them in some sort of visualization or, or bodily experience. Um, you know, and my um, my research is looking or was looking at exactly how this metaphor came to be established and, and, and in in essence created uh, its own field, right, of artificial in, in intelligence and the kind of entailments that go with that metaphor, uh, terms like memory or neural networks or even things like a vi like having a virus, right? There's an anthropomorphism there. Um, so what I did is, is I, I assembled a corpus of papers um, from what, what I call the golden age of AI. So from the moment that that term was first used, um, uh, it was invented by um, a mathematician and co computer scientist, John McCarthy in 1955 for uh, a summer workshop at Dartmouth College to be held in 1956. Uh, and I chose 32 papers by, you know, if you're familiar with the history of computing and, and AI, you'll recognize some of these names. Um, uh, 32 of the kind of most influential papers that ended with, uh, well, a, 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 a few years after the report of the, that was published, the Light Hill Report, which in the UK was published, that was very critical of the amount of money that was spent by the Department of Defense and and um, you know DARPA and the equivalent in the U.S. Um, and this kind of the the funding dried up because the kind of initial expectations of what artificial intelligence could produce were were not met um, as we as we know um, and there was a series of kind of booms and busts and we are definitely in the middle of a boom right now. That's uh, we can maybe get to that in a minute, but so. What I did with this corpus, there was about 385,000 uh, words in the in the corpus, and I looked for, this is, uh, I heard uh, Christophe use this term uh, earlier today, epistemic markers, essentially looking for keywords that were, uh, that um, could anchor a metaphor, or words that um, modify those metaphors. So, um, I, uh, you know, in my master's, I looked kind of quantitatively at uh, root metaphors that treat uh, a computing machine as a brain or as a person, anthropomorphized in some way, um, and to look at how many times they appeared metaphorically and how many times they appeared literally and how that shifted over those 20 years. Um, but what what I what I realized is when I read this book by um, it was basically talking about the contingencies of data, and that I had that I was missing a lot of interesting qualitative data that was hidden 
behind the kind of interface of my of my corpus analysis. Um, I used um, a Sketch Engine, by the way, if anybody knows that uh, that tool, it's really really amazing um, for concordance analysis and things like that. Um, so Lucasis argues um, four principles here. Number one, that data have, and he is using data in its plural here to emphasize uh, the plurality, the kind of heterogeneity of data, uh, that data is not just one thing, even though our, our uh, algorithms and our uh, corpus analysis tools treat them as one thing, just a machine readable text, of course, there's texture in there that we're missing or that we can miss. Uh, and we might want to throw out for some purposes, but as an anthropologist, I realized that there's a lot hidden in those, those artifacts um, um, that have atta attachments to particular places. So that particular geographies, particular universities or schools of thought. Um, data, and this is certainly true of my corpus, are pulled from heterogeneous sources and they each have their own kind of local attachments. The data we, we are analyzing and the algorithms we use to analyze it are of course intertwined, right? There's a kind of looping effect that happens here, uh, which is something of course, that when I went back to look at, at, at my data again, I could see quite clearly, but, um, uh, and, then, and then of course the interfaces we use to uh, interpret or present data uh, recontextualize and can, of course, obfuscate or highlight certain certain aspects of the data. So um, what I did is I literally just kind of started to map where did these papers in this corpus come from? Um, and there's basically three clusters here. And this isn't new information necessarily, but I'm trying to, or I, I, I'm, I'm in the process of trying to um, uh, look at the correlations between things like place uh, and kind of local vernacular, vernacular artifacts, as he calls it. So there's kind of a cluster in Silicon Valley. So that's, you know, IBM, Lawrence Livermore, Stanford, Berkeley, uh, in the Midwest, um, uh, University of Michigan, uh, University of Chicago, and Carnegie Mellon. And then there's the East Coast, of course, kind of dominated by MIT and, and uh, Marv Minsky and, and his students, um, and Cornell, Bell Labs, Brandeis, uh, things like that. Um, in terms of the interrelation between data and algorithm, this is just a screenshot of sketch and uh, concordance analysis. So of course, in the middle, you've got your keyword, keyword in context. And here I've searched for the term pandemonium, which if you don't know why that's relevant, I'll get to it in a minute. Um, it was a, a, a not particularly successful metaphor used to stand in for, for, for neural networks. And on the left of the red term is the kind of context leading up to the word, and on the right is the context afterwards, okay? And of course, um, one of the interesting things about the, the this algorithm, this, uh, <laughs> my kids are hanging around. Um, one of the interesting things about the algorithm, of course, is that it's not case sensitive, uh, which we don't necessarily expect it to be. But of course, what it means is that it's counting all the instances of that word that appear just in headers and footers and titles and things like that, uh, that are just repeated on every page, right? So not a big deal, but you know that's, um, that's, that's an algorithm effect, not a data effect, right? This also means that, and there's this amazing passage in, in Hilary Putnam's uh, article um, from um, the Journal of Philosophy, uh, 1974, I think, where um, he describes this thought experiment about, you know, are robots alive? About, you know, what if robots had robots? Would those robots think that robots are robots? And of course, in, in writing, he um, separates, you know, capitals robots from uh, lowercase robots to, to designate kind of first order and second order robots. And of course, this is not something that the, that the algorithm would have picked up on. It's just counting how many times that uh, robots appears. Um, and it's only in the qualitative and only in the kind of literally the font choice as an index for different kind of uh, you know, imaginary yet ontological um, entities that, that, this, that, that his point is made. Um, on the interface itself, the presentation, of course, this is another version where, you know, I'm looking for pandemonium, and it is uh, classifying the modifiers of that noun uh, and verbs that are paired with that noun. 
but of course, it's doing so by how often they appear, which is uh, as valid a method as any to present that data. But that's something I really need to keep in mind as I'm scanning these lists, because of course, uh, just because it appears a lot of times doesn't mean it's necessarily of interest to me as I'm tracing this kind of human metaphor in the computer science text. So one of the other things I looked for, and this I did look for in my original study, but um, as markers of metaphor, there are a few different things that pop up in corpora of, in metaphor studies. Um, one is kind of an explicit introduction when a writer says, you know, uh, we can use a framework of, or um, we could use the following model, or we could treat X as Y. Um, uh, the presence of similes, those are often in the literature called marked metaphors or deliberate metaphors, right? Where you're cueing the reader that this is a metaphor coming up. I don't mean this literally. Uh, the same thing with quotation marks, right? That just the single, single quotes appearing around these words. And often you find in the first year or two when these terms are used, those quotes are necessary. Uh, or some hedging is necessary to say something like, we might be able to, or we could treat this as this, um, to kind of show a little hesitation, to show that this is essentially a thought experiment, right? That we're going we're gonna to work through the entailments of this metaphor and see where it breaks down. Um, and of course, the most explicit is in, art, is in modifiers itself, like artificial intelligence or machine language, saying, look, I'm going to use this adjective so that you don't take me literally, although as we see, I think that those modifiers lose their power to modify over time. Um, Luc um, Lucisas adds a couple of more points here um, that that connect to his earlier points in, in in looking for artifacts. So this is kind of irregularities or glitches or data dirt to use a to use an effective metaphor, um, incomplete data sets. But these point either to disciplinary norms, right? So in this data set, there's a lot of work by psychologists and a lot of work by engineers. And of course, they would eventually kind of work together in this new field of computer science uh, and artificial intelligence. But coming into that field, there are different, there are, there could be different norms that appear in the, uh, in the data. And vernacular artifacts, which is mostly what I want to talk about for the last section here on uh, you know, local local uh, quirks of data that appear either from a single person, a single writer, a single analyst, or a kind of school of thought, or say, or a school like like the MIT, like MIT or like Carnegie Mellon. Um, so we can consider these these artifacts instead of as errors to be scrubbed away as signifiers taken out of context. They, they index something, they point to something. The question for the anthropologist is wh uh, what and what meaning does that have and, and how did that arise, right? So if we take the kind of theory constitutive metaphor of the giant brain, we can trace, you know, during the Second World War, this was used and we can trace the kind of um, the entailments of that metaphor starting with neurological networks in 1954 with, with Marv Minsky, who, who quickly kind of um, moved away from that in favor of symbolic artificial intelligence, which the irony is, of course, is that we're back where we started with, with this, with, with neural nets, um, and the kind of slight changes in linguistic variation over time that become, nor that become norms. But that prefix neuro is, is really versatile and is good to think with. And you know, if you browse archive for machine learning papers, that prefix neuro is tacked onto so many different things, right? To, to anchor it as part of this metaphorical universe. Of course, computers themselves, I don't think there's a better example of a metaphor that has become uh, literal than computers, right? Of course, in 1937, it was necessary to modify that word machines or modify the word computer with um, with automa automatic or um, digital. No way, we wouldn't even have been digital back then. Um, um, computing machines to distinguish it from the literal meaning, which was a person who computes. But of course now, and by 1961, I would say, was well, 63, it says here, but um, the, there, the, the modification of that term uh, was in the opposite direction, right? So computers were 
uh, unmodified pointed to machines that computed. And if you wanted to specify, you needed to say human computer. And that, that shift happens pretty quickly in about 30 years. Um, so some of the vernacular, some of the local artifacts that pop up are uh, really elegant models or metaphors that didn't really go anywhere. This is Edmund Berkeley in that book. Uh, so I'm cheating a bit here. This is from 49, a little early. Um, in comparing on the right, you've got his schematic diagram of a big mainframe, uh, early IBM. Um, from And then the photo below that is from the 1950s. And you can see that that's a fairly literal uh, sketch of what's happening here. You know, these big, almost room-sized machines passing information. And so the metaphor that made sense to him at the time was to, to describe this as, and this is the, the image on the left, as information moving along, along telegraph channels from building to building, kind of from barn to barn on a big farm property, which might seem like a strange metaphor now, but at the time, I think it made sense basically because of the size of the machines, um, you know, and the nature of passing information like packets down a telegraph, uh, telegraph line. One of the disciplinary artifacts we see here is this obsession with chess and checkers, right? And the decision-making process that goes through. Uh, on the left, of course, we have just a, a schematic, a 2D schematic of a chessboard. And on the right, um, we've got a, almost like a sideways decision tree from the, if you look at the vertex there, that's the zeroth move. And then we have, you know, um, uh, exponential, uh, you know, two to the two, two to the four, two to the six, two to the eight, as we go up and as the games progress. This is checkers here on the right by, uh, by a famous paper by Samuel. And of course, this is interesting because, again, culturally, it shows us that these scientists were equating chess. Chess was like a metonym for intelligence, right? It was the preeminent way of displaying the kind of intelligence they were interested in testing, um, which would have been, which in for many different cultural contexts would have been a quite a leap to make, right? They would have needed to have to make a case of why is this is this particular game or these two particular games uh, indexical of uh, human intelligence at, at the highest form? One, one of the local metaphors that pops up that I love is this idea of tree and decision tree. And this was um, particularly present in the writings of Simon and Newell and Shaw, their sometime com comparator. And I've included this paragraph because it can really, it really shows how they are thinking with trees. They are using trees not as a one-time metaphor, um, but they are talking about uh, bushy growths or spindly growths on the tree, uh, that where the branches fork, um, you know, working backwards along branches to the point of origin of the tree. So they're using the tree to think with. Um, and this is the kind of local, and, and only certain people in certain schools are using this kind of um, uh, this kind of language, and sometimes that language becomes part of our the, the lexicon of the discipline, and sometimes it just kind of fades away. Um, oh, and note here in the caption, of course, the word tree is in quotes to suggest that this is this is one of the first times that a tree had been used in this way, this idea of the decision tree in computer science. This is um, Frank Rosenblatt, like literally making you know, physically making a neural net with perceptrons, 1957. Um, and I just like, you know, the schematic he's drawn here and that term, uh, a catacresis, uh, perceptron was a new word used that is still in the lexicon of machine learning, but it means something a little different than it meant in, in Frank Rosenblatt's time. Um, so it's interesting that the word stuck around, but the meaning has shifted slightly, but you can still see, you can see the layers of the kind of neural network in what Frank Rosenblatt is, um, is doing almost uh, 70 years ago. And then I'll end here with um, a note about, um, well, this, this section here, this is Oliver Selfridge's notion of pandemonium. So he, he, the, the metaphor he's using here is basically describing neural networks, but before neural networks were a thing, uh, he's talking about layers of demons in hell, right? On the, 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 um, on the left there, you can see there's data demons, computational demons, cognitive demons, and they pass that information to a decision demon uh, who, who decides kind of what pattern am I looking at here? Uh, 
um, from the 1970s. This is a textbook from about 20 years later that has li has literally anthropomorphized or demonomorphized, no, you know, demonized, maybe literally demonized these these mathematical markers, these these layers of the neural net as demons who pass the information and to try and um, identify the pattern that they're looking at. There's some really nice kind of um, marginalia too. These are often scanned documents that are that are made machine readable, mm -hmm. but you've got these lovely kind of margin notes here. Um, the the library stamp uh, shows that this version of um, uh, Rosenblatt's PhD was at the university in Hanover, in Germany, um, and the hand drawn equations that are part of this of this um, of this data set not only is the corpus analysis going to miss any of any any words or or, or variables um, hand drawn um, it, there is a kind of there's personality in those in those um, in, in those strokes in that penmanship there uh, font the changes in font over time changes in how diagrams are imagined over time. You can see in the middle bottom row there, the kind of nested uh, logic sequence that of course is common in computer science now, uh, but in 1959 was just being, uh, was kind of that, that, that syntax was just being sorted out. Uh, Marv Minsky uh, has, as many of you probably know, a kind of a very particular writing style and has his own vernacular and his, has his own vernacular use of diagrams, which sometimes only he understands. Um, uh, but this is the kind of uh, the voice of the living people who created this data that gets glossed over with, with quantitative analysis. Uh, I'll leave it here and just say that, and, you know, of course, at the time, the big debate was between so-called symbolic AI um, uh, you know, Simon and Newell, Feigenbaum, uh, and Marv Minsky um, against the kind of neural network models uh, of Rosenblatt and Selfridge, McCullen Pitt, who, who created the first mathematical model for neural networks in uh, 1957, I believe. But they didn't correlate nicely to place. In fact, these guys, and they are almost all guys, uh, are moving back and forth between these institutions all the time. So sometimes it was even hard to pin down where they were when they wrote these papers. Um, so anyway, this is just part of my process in trying to find the kind of the, the vernaculars that are hidden in the data and what can they can tell us kind of culturally and socially about this movement that created, that created the entire discipline. Uh, and here we are kind of 70 years later looking back on it. So I'll leave it there and we can we can do some questions. Thank you very much, Joseph. Thank you very much. And uh, we have uh, we have time for questions. So if anyone would like to go ahead and ask questions. Jim. Um, thank you, Joseph. Really, really fascinating stuff. Um, I, I was kind of curious. Uh, this is maybe a, a fairly a uh, simple question. Um, I'm I, I'm kind of wondering like uh, how you're kind of picking out. So I mean, sometimes when you have when you're using a metaphor, you kind of have it in a web of other metaphors that are kind of being used around it. And I'm curious, especially when you're going back to these historical uh, kind of texts, whether you're kind of finding um, worries that there's kind of like dead metaphors that are kind of surrounding them in those kinds of cases. I was wondering if um, that, that was something you came across and if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think, um, um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of ways to think about it. One is that the, the, the metaphors that the community decided were good to think with and that and that were productive in, in terms like a good metaphor suggests areas for experimentation and testing. And um, there were some that really did that. I mean, the, 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 the comparison to neural nets is, was super successful and, and sticks. But like, you know, uh, the pandemonium metaphor, and there was a number of other smaller ones um, that just kind of fizzled. They just faded away. 
And you can see there's evidence of a couple of back and forths on the idea and, oh, you need another layer of demons that do X, Y, Z, or, um, you know, there, there can't just be one decision demon, there needs to be three, you know, but it just kind of fizzles in the literature. And um, the thing, the metaphors that stick are the metaphors that then create, they, they are root metaphors for an entire set of concepts that then suggest uh, like the idea of memory and neural networks and, and you know, the things that come from that root metaphor. Um, and that's the kind of thing I tried to, to look for. Um, but I'm sure there's more hidden in there. As you can tell, I just, I, I kind of, I kind of skimmed and poked and, and looked for cool pictures. And um, I mean, if there's a team of grad students, I'm sure they could go through it with a fine tooth comb, but, uh, you know, because I mean, one of the frustrating things about corpus analysis is that there is no standard orthographic way of marking metaphors, right? There's so many different ways. Sometimes they're not marked at all and people, people use them and don't even think of them as metaphorical, right? And so then the question is looking at the intent of the speaker or the writer in this case and thinking, are they making a comparison here? Or are they, is this just kind of naturally part of their speech? And, and, and what are the entailments of, of, the, of the terms they're using? Um, Really interesting. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Stefan. Yeah, thank you. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I'm trying to draw the right methodological lessons from it. Um, and one of the lessons I think you were suggesting is that there can be these levels of, I think of them as levels of fine grain that carry information about, you know, that are historically relevant in this case, having to do with, um, you know, the encoding of metaphors, I guess. Um, and I guess that the, here's where I get a little worried, if you will, um, you know, as you admitted early on in your talk, you can kind of, there's, it's almost indefinite levels of, of grain that one could start exploring. And, uh, I was hoping you could maybe give me your impressions on, um, you know, even just a sort of heuristic qualitative impression, like when does this pay off? When does starting to dig through these levels pay off? You know, cause it's costly in terms of time and other resources. And, and, and when does it sort of not pay off as well as somebody who's gone down these rabbit holes, if you will? Yeah, thanks for that. That's it's such a great question. Um, I mean, I yeah, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. I mean, I like to think of it that the le different levels of brainedness are um, fit for purpose. They're just fit for different purpose. Um, and, and I mean, uh, partly, partly that's kind of. Um, um, that's that's kind of obviously true. As in, if I was doing a biography or a deep dive into the life of Marv Minsky, I would be reading every page and looking at all the notes he was scribbling and all that kind of stuff. But if I want to get a sense of just the overall language use, then I'm, I can I can um, I can um, um, just just look at top level quantitative kind of cor uh, corpora analysis. I think the ideal is to, and anthropology has this description uh, uh, of describing situations as thick, thick description, right? And th that can mean a number of things, but one of the things it means is, is to kind of try and use different levels of, 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 um, of grain, right? And so what that might mean is that I, I, I'm interested in the kind of top level, like the kind of what the numbers say about how that metaphor shifted, but it, connecting it to particular usages of, and, and it doesn't have to be um, uh, all encompassing, I can just kind of pick and choose a few interesting ones, gives a, a kind of sense of flavor to the numbers. And it gives mm. a kind of thickness to how these metaphors that were present were being produced and um, uh, collectively produced by the conversations they were part of. There is a great uh, piece at the end of um, one of the papers by by uh, Selfridge with Pandemonium, and in the audience of that conference was like John McCarthy and Marv Minsky and all these heavy heavy hitters, and and they and they transcribed the back and forth that they were having, 
And, and so in that way, it kind of brings life into this metaphor that pops up in the corpus and then dies away. It gives you this idea of how they were using this as a tool for thinking. Um, mm. You know, and, and you, you can't necessarily make super generalizations, generalizations about that, uh, but it adds a level of, of, of human, like how this is used as a cultural tool with which to practice science, I think. That's interesting, thanks. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Hi, um, thank you for the really fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm just wondering if you have ever thought about or explored whether um, different metaphors can reveal um, different attitudes towards these theories and you know entities. Because when I think about the imagery of a tree as opposed to a pandemonium, it gives me really different feelings. And I'm wondering if there you know, some hidden meanings and maybe hints and clues that can help us judge um, people's stances towards these theories at certain times? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thanks, Stephanie. And um, I mean, there's, again, there's uh, several answers to that. W one of them, the short answer is yes, there's been a lot of work done on how does the metaphor choice uh, frame people's understanding of events and that can have high stakes as in, you know, if, if the national discourse from a um, national leader frames uh, immigration as a flood or as a disease or as an invasion, um, instead of using a, met a different metaphor that doesn't require force or quarantining, um, you know, there are entailments to these metaphors that, that, that do make a difference um, in science and in um, I, I try to take a more cautious approach, which is to say that just because we see patterns in discourse doesn't mean we can necessarily make a jump to how people are thinking. Um, that I I I there I mean there are people who work in what's called cognitive anthropology and try and 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 work to work on exactly what the model is in people's minds. Um, in my experience, um, uh, scientists use metaphor fairly thoughtfully and can even, even something like artificial intelligence where most scientists would be like, well, that's not a metaphor anymore. Like, like, like the, they're both just different systems for processing information, right? We can call it intelligence, it's not a metaphor. But if you say, well, treat it as a metaphor, Instead of calling it artificial intelligence, can we call it something else? Can we call it, um, you know, uh, fast number crunching or or predictive technology or um, self-referential um, looping effects or something something that doesn't necessarily equate it? I, I find, and I shouldn't just say scientists. People can hold kind of two models or even more in their mind at the same time and are fairly, and can be fairly flexible about the frameworks they apply. I don't take a kind of, some of you might know the work of Lakoff and, and Johnson about metaphor and, and the kind of ubiquity of metaphor in our everyday speech and in science uh, discourse. They take a fairly deterministic approach in that these, this is how we think about, and we have to think about it with metaphor and with these specific culturally approved metaphors. I think I think people can be a little more nimble than that, um, but that's something again that that there's there's you know in in psychological linguistics and cognitive linguistics there's a lot of work being done um, uh, on that. Um, yeah, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Yeah. Thank you. That gave me a lot to think about. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. Thank you, Joseph. Another round of applause. Thank you.